And as you land there, just let me remind you that um, Ezekiel is a man ministering as a captive, taken from his home in uh, Jerusalem to Babylon. And he's in an outpost uh, in Babylon uh, on the river Chabar. And so as a captive there, he's ministering to people who are being comforted by false prophets and being told they're going to get to go back home here pretty quickly. As we've told you before, his contemporary Jeremiah is back in Jerusalem with those that are left and everybody else is telling uh, the people you're going to get to to stay where you're at. You're not going to go join your, your wicked brothers in captivity. And Ezekiel, uh, his counterpart, Jeremiah, is saying, look, we're, we're going to go. It's, it's going to happen. We're going to be judged. And so essentially, uh, Ezekiel, like most prophets, and, and really I think any uh, faithful pastor of any time, his ministry is really to uh, afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. That's really, you know, what uh, the prophet or the mouthpiece of God does. That's what the word prophet means. And so the prof false prophets, all they want to do is uh, false, falsely prophesy peace and safety and comfort. And, and, you know, the New Testament, Timothy would call that, you know, they're tickling ears and whatnot. So when we come to uh, chapter 14, then uh, God is going to show them how severe their hard heartedness is. And he's dealing still with the elders who influenced the people. These are the ones who had mixed, you know, idolatry, pornography with their worship uh, as they went along in life. And then the prophets who were falsely prophesying in the name of the Lord, even though it wasn't true. And so in chapter 14, verse 1, now some of the elders of Israel came to Ezekiel and Ezekiel says they sat before me. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their hearts and put before them that which causes them to stumble in, into iniquity. And should I let myself be inquired of at all by them? And therefore speak to them and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, every one of the house of Israel who sets up idols in his heart and puts before him what causes him to stumble into iniquity and then comes to the prophet, I, the Lord, will answer him who comes according to the multitude of his idols, that I may seize the house of Israel by their heart, because they are all estranged from me by their idols. And so the elders are in a tight spot. The heat's being turned up every year that passes, and they're not going back to uh, Jerusalem or back to Israel. They're getting more and more uncomfortable. And so they now come to seek Ezekiel. They sense uh, that he does have the word of the Lord, even though they don't want to believe what his counsel is. So these elders came, uh, you know, and I put in quotation marks, seeking counsel from the Lord. They, they want God to tell them something that will make them feel better in their time of difficulty. And essentially, the Lord says, you aren't worthy of my counsel. And this would be a hard thing to hear. It's also a discomforting thing for those not walking in integrity with the Lord. But the reality is that no true direction can be had by those who harbor idolatry. And Psalm 66 verse 18 says the same thing. If you, if you harbor iniquity in your heart, if you, if you keep it there knowingly, then God won't hear you. When, you. when you knowingly harbor sin and you don't give it to the Lord, it impedes the relationship with the Lord. And so this would have been a shocker, I'm sure, to these guys. But Ezekiel's not done. He's just getting started. Therefore, in verse 6, say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, here's, here's his key message for them. Repent and turn from your idols. And turn your faces away from all your abominations. For anyone of the house of Israel or of the strangers who dwell in Israel, who separates himself from me and sets up his idols in his heart and puts before him what causes him to stumble into iniquity, then comes to a, a prophet to inquire of him concerning me. 
I, the Lord, will answer him by myself, and I will set my face against that man and, and make him a sign and a proverb, and I will cut him off from the midst of my people. And here's our phrase again, used 50 times in this book. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. And if the prophet is induced, this is the prophet either uh, true or false to speak anything, I, the Lord, have induced that prophet, and I will stretch out my hand against him and destroy him from among my people, Israel. So specifically, there is the false prophets induced by the Lord to speak, but also destroyed for speaking lies, and they shall bear their iniquity. The punishment of the prophet shall be the same as the punishment of the one who inquired that the house of Israel may no longer stray from me, nor be profaned any more with all their transgressions, but that they may be my people, and I may be their God, says the Lord God. The only way that the Lord can be someone's God, and they his people, is for there to be no separation, for them to walk in the ways of the Lord. So these elders come, they want the goodness of God, but they don't want the holiness of God. That's a lot of people throughout history. Want God's favor, want God's goodness, want God's blessing, but don't really want to separate myself from the desires of my flesh and the traditions of my family or my upbringing or, or my culture. And so what God says to these elders is the only counsel that I'm going to give you is repent. Repent, that's it, turn. He uses repent and then turn, which is essentially the same word. Not just to make a mental ascension to what is being said, but then to turn your life around. And until they heed this counsel, there is none other for them. I'll tell you as a pastor, that's the hardest thing uh, about seeing broken people, hurting people, um, people that are in need, people that are seeking so desperately in their heart, the Lord, is so often they really only want their thing fixed. And, and they, they don't even know it many times. They just, their idea of seeking the Lord is seeking him to fix their thing. But they don't really want to repent because that takes your life down to uh, the concrete. <laughs> that repentance starts to tear down all the false foundations you built your life on. And that's a very hard thing. But it's the only way that, that God can then be your Lord. Uh, and so... Not just Savior, but Lord is what God wants to be. So until they heed this counsel, there's none other for them. And by the way, I have here for you Mark chapter 1, verse 15. When you think about all that Jesus did in the you know, three and a half years of his ministry, what you need to understand is primarily Jesus was a preacher and teacher. The miracles were only to get people's attention and then to prove that what he said about his power spiritually uh, could be seen in the, the tangible and the practical. So if I can do these things that blow your mind physically, I can also do the things that I say spiritually. And so he said in Mark chapter 1, verse 15, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. And here was Jesus' primary message, repent and believe in the good news, which was him, believe in him. This was his primary message, and all the other messages rotated around this one common theme, the person and the work of Jesus Christ, and the need to repent and follow after him. Now, shockingly, in this particular passage, if the people won't repent, God says, I'll give you what you want. And please understand this. God, he is sovereign. He is working out his plan. And then there's this other side, which I won't understand until heaven, that says God always does give us what we want. He doesn't force anybody. And so if we don't want God long enough, uh, he will eventually set that uh, not wanting him in place. He'll say, okay, I'll help you out. If I've shown you all the wonders and the given, given you the prophets and the miracles, and you won't return, you won't repent, you won't love me, you won't see what I've done for you, then I'll actually help you along your way. And so what he does here is he says, these prophets, these false prophets, I've induced them, which is a mind-blowing thing. God actually induces the false prophets at a point where the people won't listen to the true prophets. 
He says, okay, I'll give you what you want. Now all you're going to get is the ability to hear these people who have been induced by me to lie to you. This is unbelievable. Now, please remember, when we can't figure things out, we have to understand who God is and what his nature is. And while I don't truly understand everything about this, I know that James says that God cannot be tempted, nor does, James 1.13, God tempt others. At the same time, God is in control of everything, uh, even Satan. Everything that gets done, good or evil, God at least allows and or uh, causes on the good side of things. And the best story to illustrate this is a story uh, back in 1 Kings. You might turn, turn there with me, verse uh, 22, excuse me, verse 19 of 1 Kings 22. And, and the setup is this. There's a wicked king named Ahab. You might know him, Ahab and his uh, wife Jezebel. And, and Ahab loved to listen to false prophets. He had a whole stable of them. There's this one guy named uh, Micaiah who is a true prophet, for some reason, like all of these guys, they, they know what's true. They, they reject knowingly. That's the thing. We always know what's true initially. We reject it. And so he's got all these false prophets, but he likes having this one guy around who tells him the truth. But at the same time, he gets ticked off at what this guy's saying. So finally, after rejecting this guy's truth over and over and over, uh, Micaiah then drops a truth bomb on Ahab. In verse 19 of 1 Kings 22, Micaiah said, Therefore, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord on his throne, and all the host of heaven standing by, on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, Who will persuade Ahab to go up that he may fall at Ramoth Gilead? And so one spoke in this manner, another spoke in that manner, and then a spirit, this is a demonic spirit, came forward and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. And the Lord said to him, in what way? So the spirit said, I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all the prophets. And the Lord said, you shall persuade him and also prevail. Go out and do so. And therefore, look, verse 23, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these prophets of yours, and the Lord has declared disaster against you. The Lord gives his knowledge and his light to every man who wants it. That's what we see. The light of Christ, even John 1, is shown into the heart of every man. They, they can see the goodness of God and the majesty of God through creation if we just look but if we reject long enough, and especially reject the kind of truth and, and influence that the Jews had by having the scriptures, we too, in, in a nation that is one of the most favorable to this day towards Christianity and the freedom and the ability to read the Bible and to share the Bible, when you have as much knowledge as they or we had, then uh, at some point, God says, if you're going to reject all this knowingly, I'm just going to help you along. And the enemy loves nothing more than to do that. And so this situation in Israel was that they, they were there, these captives. They've even been taken captive and their lives torn down to the very, they've been displaced. Everything they've known is taken away and they still won't turn. So God says, I'll just induce some people to help you along. Like, I've done everything I can do for you. And so verse 12, he begins to expound on how severe their situation is because we can always uh, become comfortable in our situation the darker the things get some people become very uh, convicted and hurt and hate the things around them uh, and and yet desire for repentance and change and god to be glorified and other people just kind of get okay with it they, they just get as the heat turns up they become okay with the with the bath water as it were. And, and the, the word of the Lord now comes again to Ezekiel and says, Son of man, when a, a land sins against me by, notice this, persistent unfaithfulness. We're not talking about people that are really struggling here, fighting for their, their lives, as it were, spiritually with the Lord. We're talking about persistent unfaithfulness, in this case, for hundreds of years. I will stretch out my hand against it. And I'll cut off its supply of bread, send famine on it, cut off man and beast from it. 
And then uh, notice this. Even if these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they would deliver only themselves by their righteousness, says the Lord God. And if I cause wild beasts to pass through the land and they empty it and make it so desolate that no man may pass through because of the wild beast, even though these three men were in it as I live, says the Lord, they would deliver neither sons nor daughters, only they would be delivered and the land would be desolate. Or if I bring a sword on the land and say, sword, go through the land, and I cut off man and beast from it, even though these three men were in it, as I live, says the Lord God, they would deliver neither sons nor daughters, but only themselves would be delivered. Or if I send a pestilence into that land and pour out my fury on it in blood, and I, I cut off from it man and beast, even though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, as I live, says the Lord God, they would deliver neither son or daughter. They would deliver only themselves by their righteousness. For thus says the Lord God, how much more it shall be when I send my four severe judgments on Jerusalem, the sword, the famine, the wild beasts, and the pestilence to cut off man and beast from it. And yet behold, there's always a remnant. There will be left in it a remnant who will be brought out both sons and daughters and surely they will come out to you, and you will see their ways and their doings. And then you will be comforted concerning the disaster that I have brought upon Jerusalem, all that I have brought upon it, and, and then they will comfort you. And when you see their ways and their doings, you shall know that I have done nothing without cause, um, without cause that I have uh, done in it. I've done nothing without cause that I have done in this land, says the Lord God. Now, as we look at this last section, uh, we want to focus on these three guys. This is his illustration. Uh, Noah, Daniel, and Job. And these three men, uh, if you've read your Bible, you understand they're biblical heroes. They're known for, notice verse 14, and then you can uh, look down again in verse 20. They are known for their righteousness. They lived righteously in eras where very few uh, were. They were swimming upstream from dark cultures. And yet what he's saying is even their immense faith could not shelter Israel from the judgment that is coming because of Israel's persistent rebellion. And this is a truth for us. By following the Lord, we can influence many others. We have this, this beautiful opportunity to, to be the, the beautiful feet of those who bring the gospel uh, to people and, and preach the good news. But even though we can influence others, we cannot save them. My faith can only save me. And so these are people who have put their trust in their, their history, their family, their ethnicity, their religion. And God's saying, none of that's going to save you. This is about you and me, your walk with me. And these three men uh, give us insight into how God delivers. And so while these three men could not save this group, they were examples for any who would think about their stories of how they made it through times similar to the time of Ezekiel. And so I want to finish our time by just looking at three, these three men and the characteristics of their life. And we begin with Noah. Noah. Uh, you might go back to Genesis chapter 6. I have just a, a piece of it there for you up on the screen. I'll get it there. There you go. And in Genesis chapter 6, we'll go to verse 5, where it says that then the Lord saw that wickedness, and the wickedness of man was great in the earth, that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he uh, made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So remember that uh, sorry is like, it's, it's technically an anthropomorphism. It's uh, us trying to put uh, God into human terms 
because he's, he's un, unknowable in some ways on this side of heaven. So the, the best way the writers can figure out is to say God's, the, the idea is God's hurt and he's grieved in his heart. And so the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for uh, I am sorry that I have made them. And then uh, here's the but. Here's the big but. Uh, in the Bible, buts are always uh, big. Um, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And this is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just or a righteous man, same word, perfect or blameless, not that he never sinned, but that uh, generally like his life reflected the Lord in his generations. Notice this, Noah walked uh, with God. And so Noah is an example of, of righteous obedience. And Noah walked with God by faith when in his generation, no, literally no one else would. And uh, Noah then escaped judgment through the ark. Now, if you go with me to Hebrews chapter 11, Hebrews chapter 11 is called the hall of faith. Uh, and, it, and it basically defines faith and then it gives examples of faith from the Old Testament. But I want you to go to verse 7 to start, and then don't leave there. I just want you to stay there for a couple minutes with me. It says in verse 7 of Hebrews 11, By faith Noah, being divinely warned of things, notice, not yet seen. Not yet seen. And that is the flood. Moved with godly fear prepared an ark for the saving of his household by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. Okay? So Noah is told to build a boat when there's never been a drop of rain. Noah does this for years, decades. And Noah, when people come up to him, preached righteousness. He, he shared what was coming, even though decade after decade, uh, it didn't come true. And people scoffed and laughed and didn't believe and mocked. And then the day came when, as we talked about a week or so ago, the, the Lord brought Noah in and it began to rain and the Lord shut the door. But he was an heir of the righteousness because righteousness is according to faith. Now, what is faith? Appreciate you asking. Look at verse 1 of chapter 11 of Hebrews. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, or it's the realization of things hoped for, the evidence or the confidence of things, what? Just like Noah, not yet seen. Not yet seen. And so the just or the righteous, according to Romans chapter 1, verse 17, shall live by what? Faith. Shall live by things not yet seen. And if you look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, it says this, But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that God is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Now, here's the difficulty. The kind of faith we're talking about that is indicative of righteousness is not what I would call forced faith. That's just a piece of it. I noticed that in America, one of our hardest things is if you ask people about steps of faith, normally it's, well, you know, my, my, my grandchild got sick or my uh, this person died in a car wreck in my family, or uh, I, I had cancer, or, you know, you name it. I lost my job, and then, you know, I just believed in God, and he saw me through it. And that is faith. That is faith. But it's not what we're talking about. Faith for the Christian is being able to hear from God and then do a thing that he's told you you should do, even though you cannot see the outcome yet, and typically it does not make sense. Faith is not, I believe I should do this, and now if everything matches up, I will do this. 
Faith is, I believe God told me to do this, and then I will go do this. That's the faith of the righteous. And this is the challenge of the American Christian life. So many people sit in chairs across the United States, and, and they ardently want to believe in God, but they do not walk by any other faith than God forces them into. If, if they are told to do it and it doesn't add up, well, what about this and this and this and this? Well, if it doesn't add up on my pros and cons list, then I won't do it. That's not faith. That's, that's accounting. I'd say most accountants, probably sorry accountants, struggle with faith, right? Because the numbers have to match. The, I'm a numbers person. It has to match. And some people, you know, like some people are, are given more faith than other people, but you have to exercise the amount that God gives you. So if, if I've got the faith of, uh, you know, if, you, if you've got more faith than me in, in your little, you know, in your little pinky, then I still got to exercise my little pinky's worth of faith. Got to look at that. Uh, uh, I got to curl that sucker. And, uh, you know, it, faith is a muscle. And so the, it's so important because it's why people walk through the Christian life not experiencing uh, God intimately because they don't walk by biblical faith. They don't even know what it is. And this is attested to so oftentimes by the many small groups I go to and we talk about these things. You can see it's just over people's head. And so it's important because if you don't walk by faith, uh, Romans 1.17 says we go from faith to faith, then you won't have uh, the proof that the righteousness of God is really in there. And these are the things that cause you to access heaven and eternity and live an abundant life. In John chapter 20, and we'll leave this subject, verse 29, Thomas is your perfect guy who followed Jesus, but he, he wanted it all to add up. And he said, I will not believe that he's been resurrected unless I you know, stick my finger in those wounds. And when he finally got to do it, Jesus said, well, well blessed are you who did that, but blessed are more are those who have believed and not yet seen. That's faith. Now, uh, what about the second guy on our list, Daniel? Daniel is an example of prayer. And uh, specifically, I want you to write down, if you're taking notes, thanksgiving. Daniel is unique in that he is a contemporary of Ezekiel. He's alive right now. When Ezekiel writes this, Daniel's a living biblical legend before he's even born. Very few people are that. And so he is a captive in another part of Babylon, the capital city of Babylon, but everybody already knows about him. And Daniel is a guy who's going to be saved uh, in persecution. And if you want to go to Daniel chapter 6 with me, Daniel chapter 6, I'm going to start reading in verse 1. At this time, by the way, Daniel is probably almost 90 years old. He served under uh, Nebuchadnezzar, and now the Babylonian Empire has been overthrown after those who succeeded Nebuchadnezzar botched it all up. And we have now Darius the Mede, who is the new king, and it pleads Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be over the whole kingdom. And over these three governors, and Daniel uh, was one of the governors. So even though the regime changed, Daniel was regarded highly enough that he became one of the highest uh, three uh, rulers in all of uh, Medo-Persia. And of course, uh, people were upset about this because Daniel, it says in verse 3, distinguished himself above the governors and the, the satraps because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. So the governors and the satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they couldn't find any fault because he was, he was faithful, nor was there any error or fault found in him. And these men then said, well, we won't be able to find any charge against Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. That's some kind of statement. So these governors and these satraps thronged before the king, and they said, Oh, King Darius, live forever. And all the governors uh, of the kingdoms and the governors, uh, the administrators, the satraps, the, the counselors, the advisors, 
They've consulted together to establish a royal decree and a firm decree that whoever petitions any god or man for 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the, the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree in, in writing so that it cannot be changed. That was a law according to the Medo-Persians. Once you establish a decree, it could not be changed. They knew this. And so uh, they said, now it can't be altered. And therefore, Darius, he was all puffed up. He's like, well, who wouldn't want, who, who wouldn't want to be worshipped for 30 days <laughs> only? Uh, that could be me. He signed the decree. Now, da when Daniel, uh, verse 10, knew that the, the writing was signed, and essentially he knows this is his death warrant if he continues to pray and worship the Lord, he went home, and in his upper room, with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day, and he prayed, and now notice this, please, and he gave thanks, as was his custom since his early days. He gave thanks, as was his custom. Which, by the way, it makes me think, you know, what is, what is my custom? What is your custom? These guys knew they were going to be able to find him. They end up busting in on him. They know where he's going to be three times a day. They know he's going to be giving thanks. And by the way, you know the end of the story. He's saved from the lion's den, and then these guys get pitched in, and the lions eat them before they even hit the ground. That's one of my favorite stories ever. I mean, Daniel, they're just like mute. They're sitting there. Nur, 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 nur. They kick these guys in dead before they even hit the ground. That's for another time. But what was it? It was Thanksgiving. It was Thanksgiving. Daniel uh, was thankful. And then uh, finally, Job. Job. And by the way, I should mention this. When you read Romans 1 and you see the indictment on the wicked and how they, uh, even though they know God, they ignore him and then they're disobedient to the point that God gives them over to a debased mind and they start... Uh, you know, committing sins one with another. Um, there's, there's one indictment in there that stands out above all others. Nor were they thankful. Nor were they thankful. One of the greatest indications of a righteous heart is thankfulness for even that which God allows, which can and, and will be devastating potentially. Finally, Job. Uh, Job you know this, is an example of patience. Um, there's from James right there, uh, chapter 5, verse 11. Indeed, we, uh, we count them who endure. You have, you have heard, when you're talking about blessed people, we, encount, we, we, we count them blessed to endure. You've heard of the perseverance, or that word's patience, of Job, and seen the end intended by the Lord. And in Job's story, although he went through so much suffering, the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. So Job is tested severely, and yet I please, uh, I want you to please notice this because we're going to read it in a second, but this is something that people overlook with Job. Job's endurance was fueled by worship. Now Job's going to question everything about God except God's integrity. Job doesn't always have a good attitude, which by the way, you don't have to have a good attitude to be patient. You do to be long-suffering. <laughs> Never said Job was long-suffering. Never said he like did it with joy. Thank you, Lord, for these boils. Uh, <laughs> but God, uh, God always tells us to be patient because God is merciful. He, he knows uh, that, that we struggle with that. And so Job's in, endurance is fueled by worship. And then Job is saved not from suffering. He's saved through suffering. Okay. So now Job, and, and then we're wrapping it up. Job chapter 1, we're going to start in verse 6. We've already been told that Job is the, the most righteous man in the East. And uh, he makes sacrifices for his kids every day because they don't walk with the Lord. He's hoping that he can like stave off some kind of judgment. In verse 6, now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? And Satan answered to the Lord and said, from going to and fro, uh, walking back and forth on the earth. And the Lord said to Satan, uh, 
have you considered my servant Job? So the idea is Satan's looking for somebody to pick on. And the Lord says, how about Job? That's a bit unsettling. He said, there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and an upright or righteous man, one who fears God and shuns evil. So Satan answered the Lord and said, does Job fear God for nothing? You put a hedge of protection around him, around his household, and everything he has. You bless the work of his hands. You've given him possessions. But now stretch out your hand and touch all these things he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. Satan's challenge is if you didn't bless Job, he wouldn't love you. See, Job never knows all this is going on, but God picks Job to prove that even if he takes away Job's blessings, Job will still love Jesus. That's how it works. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that, you, uh, all that he has is in your power. The Lord didn't do it, but he said you could do it. Only don't lay a hand on his person. So Satan went out from his presence. Now, there is a day, verse 13, when Job's sons are eating and drinking uh, wine in their oldest brother's house. And a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys were feeding beside them. And the Sabians raided them and took them away. Indeed, they've killed your servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone escaped to tell you. Why, he's still speaking. Another came and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. And while he was still speaking, another came and said, The Chaldeans formed three bands, raided the camels, took them away, yes, killed the servants with the edge of the sword. I alone have escaped to tell you. While he's speaking... Another one came, said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. Suddenly a great wind came and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young people, and they are, are dead, and I alone have escaped to tell you. And you and I have never had a day like that. Never, ever, no, not, never. And what was Job's response? I want you to see this. Then Job arose, and he tore his clothes, and he shaved his head, and he fell to the ground and he worshiped. And he said, naked I came from the uh, womb of my mother and naked I shall return. The Lord gave, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And notice this, verse 22. And in all this, Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. And if you notice through Job's story, and there's 30 chapters of Job complaining and having friend, frenemies, I call them, turn on him. He questions God. He has ups and downs, but periodically he just blurts out worship. And I know that my Redeemer lives. I know it in my heart. Uh, throughout the thing, periodically in his ups and downs, he clings uh, to worship. And so, um, in conclusion, I'd say that if you are... Uh, Afraid you might be judged. Then like Noah, walk in faithful obedience. God will tell you and I what he wants from us if we but ask. It begins with knowing the Lord. But be faithful. Step out of your comfort zone. If you're being persecuted, then... Be prayerful, and by prayerful, I mean, uh, thank God. That's what Jesus said. Be thankful when people persecute you. But this is a supernatural prayer request because you and I are not naturally thankful. We are naturally vengeful. And then finally with Job, if you are suffering, be patient. And by the way of patience, I mean worship God. The patience is induced by worship. Turn on the worship music. Sing as loud as you can sing to the Lord. Meditate on the words of the things that we just sung. And, uh, and let God meet you where you're at. The Psalms are the most beloved of all of the scriptures because they are worship and they are prayers. And they ask nothing of any man. They let the writer come to God with his ups and his downs and let God sift through it and give him conclusions about God's goodness. Finally, God does nothing without cause. Please understand that. 
God does nothing without cause. When I don't know things, Chuck Smith used to say, I just fall back on what I do know, and that's what God is good, and he does nothing without cause. He does everything so that people will know that he is the Lord. And Father God, we thank you for those truths. We pray that you would please give us the ability to, to live these things out. Give us true faith, not faith that's fashioned according to the things we can see. Give us the ability, Lord, to uh, be patient, to worship through uh, suffering. Father, make us thankful even when things uh, don't look like um, they're very pleasant. And Lord, show yourself strong on our behalf. Deliver these in here from suffering. Lord, uh, give them the ability to escape judgment. And Father, um, see them through persecution. In Jesus' name. Amen. Would you guys stand?